that sense of muscle mass being undesirable, I think that goes in the same category as women who think they'll grow a penis and a beard if they start weight training. I haven't gone on a powerlifting rant in quite a while, so go ahead and buckle your seat belts because I got some things to get off my chest. I was doing some keyword research this morning. I often research keywords in order to get inside your guys' head, see what topics you think are interesting so I can make a video telling you why you're wrong, like this one. And on the list of topics that get searched for from my viewers, powerlifting program was one that ranked at the top. It had a very high volume associated with it. So that got me thinking, what other terms are people searching for that's related to programming? So I searched broader terms like strength program, size program, mass program, bodybuilding program, five by five program, nothing, 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 nothing. Now what that does is confirm something that I've said repeatedly, which is that the modern culture of strength training has shifted since strength sports have gotten more popular. We have a lot of people searching for powerlifting, very few people searching for other more traditional modes of training. Now, I would expect, even if there were this many dedicated powerlifters, the people that are the most serious should still be working the hardest to try to shore up weak points or to try to add size, to try to fill out their frame because it takes years to do. But nobody is looking at that. So I wanna talk about what causes this, why this shift has happened, why powerlifting is so popular, and why people's approach to powerlifting is now so different than it was 15, 20, 30 years ago. Now, the two big things I've noticed since powerlifting and other strength sports have become more popular is that one, there's a trend of over-specialization. That means that people find barbell sports first and that becomes most of what they do. And they're good modes of training. You will get stronger doing that. But if your training is limited to your favorite barbell movements, you're going to find over time that weak points will pop up. If your training is kind of one note, you have less tools to get over these hurdles, and that's kind of a problem. There's also a strong argument to be made that all new athletes, whether they're field athletes or lifters, should be doing more varied work to widen their base out. This is the whole premise of the base peak dynamic I talk about in the books I've written. There is a difference between the developmental basic stuff that, that puts the big rocks in place that you're going to be able to build more specialized qualities off of. You engage in this base development. Once you have enough resources to pull from, you can sharpen it down to the tip of a spear and use that to get very, very good at one thing. And that's where you get the highest levels of performance. But you can't do that if all you do is training is game day prep year round. You have to break outside of that. Now, the other thing that's related to this is the general allergy I notice people have to hard work. I've addressed the difficulty of things like cardio and general conditioning and high rep squat work and things that are very hard but also extremely productive to bring the best package. It's super easy to just lean on your identity as a power lifter because you've over romanticized what these barbell lifts do and it's become an easy way to dismiss things that you might think aren't that important but really you think they're uncomfortable and you'll look for any reason not to do them. Now to get to the bottom of this we have to know why powerlifting has become so popular. The most obvious answer is that it is the most accessible sport that there is. Olympic weightlifting is extremely technical. Strongman has fixed weights, which means you have to be a certain level of strength to sign up in the first place. And bodybuilding requires years of development and very long, very hard preps where you basically have to live like a monk. These arenas have very high thresholds for participation. Powerlifting took the exact opposite approach. As I talk about powerlifting scraping the bottom of the barrel just to get more entry fees, people are gonna mistake what I'm saying as dismissiveness of new or unmotivated lifters. There are people that feel very strongly that more people lifting is better than none, so we should do everything to get as many people involved. And I agree with that. This is not all or nothing. And by no means am I saying, if you're not ready to be at the top of the game, don't even bother. There is a ton of value to recreational training, to light training, even in frequent training, if that's all you can do. My concern is more with the organization that these federations use in order to get more money and the effect that that has on strength culture as a whole. So real quick guys, if you found any of this helpful, informative, entertaining, please consider hitting that subscribe button. I appreciate everybody's support. It's the only reason I'm able to do this in the first place. And I'm telling you, we got some big things lined up on this channel. You wanna make sure you don't miss anything. So consider my iceberg. You have most sports which have the very tip being occupied by people who are talented, people that are disciplined. You have the most viable athletes there the bottom of the iceberg is much, much bigger. And that encompasses new lifters, unserious lifters, and unmotivated lifters. Now, as much as these people should be encouraged to keep going, 
They're also the people that can take more than they give. They're the people you have to kick out of your training group because they show up late and they dick around the whole time. Having a passing affinity for lifting is not the same as being a serious lifter. Now again, I'm not saying there isn't a space for these people. I'm just talking about the organization. So consider what most pro sporting organizations do. They have their best athletes at the top. That gets advertising dollars. That's what everybody watches and follows. And they have the established methods for finding and building upon excellence. So the amateur ranks who are new and eager to perform are constantly focused on this hierarchy. They're constantly looking up to better ways of doing things. Whether you're talking about Olympic sports, field sports, it doesn't matter. The people at the top are the ones that pull the entire training culture forward. They're the ones that pave the way, they're out in front. So the effect is that the amateur ranks, whether you're talking about high school football, whether you're talking about the white belt jujitsu class at your local martial arts dojo, they all have these tools that are derived from what the best do. And the culture becomes saturated with those topics and those strategies. Now what happens with powerlifting is the bottom of this iceberg gets catered to. That is a business model of powerlifting because nobody's paying advertising dollars for the best lifters unless they have a big social media campaign and then they're getting those on their own. So the difference with powerlifting is that it's a sport built by the consumers for the consumers. So where other sports focus on the top, powerlifting focuses on the bottom and they do that by creating infinite categories, having literally trophies for everybody and having absolutely no barrier to entry. So powerlifting has specifically organized itself to take entry fees from the bottom of the iceberg. They take a no lifter left behind policy. They want anybody and everybody with a $100 entry fee to pay to sign up and participate. Now, again, I'm not saying there isn't a place for that or that's inherently bad. I'm just saying that when that business model gets scaled up to prioritize profit, there is a negative effect to the training culture as a whole, and I'm going to get to that. So this bottom of the iceberg becomes what powerlifting caters to. Powerlifting becomes popular because these people now have a lower barrier to entry to be able to participate and be part of the culture. So they're the ones occupying YouTube. They're the ones searching on Google. They're the ones determining which keywords are going to rank higher. And the inevitable end result is that the creators like me that look at that tailor their content to fit that demand. So the information presented to all trainees ends up becoming information that was really curated by the lowest common denominator. And there's this kind of weird echo chamber because most of these people, they have misconceptions about training and their searches are going to reflect those misconceptions. Now that whole presentation brings me to the meat of this discussion, which is about those misconceptions. And the drum that I continuously beat is that you guys need to be making sure no matter how far you charge ahead, that you are not neglecting those big rocks. You're not neglecting the big developmental stuff. There's a reason that guys back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s did a ton of volume, did a ton of different exercises, essentially trained like bodybuilders, whether they wanted to be career powerlifters or not. And that's because bodybuilding, whether you want to accept this or not, is one of the most functional things you can do. It's not just relevant to other sports, it's extremely relevant to powerlifting. And you will be better by having a more well-rounded physique, not just by looking better, but by actually being balanced so that you stave off overuse issues and injury. Your potential ceiling for how much force you can produce is going to be higher in that situation. You're going to gain mass and fill out your frame. All of you guys that are 165 pounds and 5'10 think that you're destined to be the next great 165 pound lifter. The problem with that reasoning is that you take away the most accessible thing you have to increase your strength and that is the acquisition of muscle mass. If you're one of these guys that reaches out to a coach saying, hey, I wanna put 100 pounds in my total, but I also wanna drop two weight classes. You are putting yourself in a box where the only thing you can really improve is neurological adaptations. You can improve coordination, you can improve force output, but you are going to be capped by whatever your genetic potential is to put out force at that weight. For most people, it's not very high. Remember that when we start training, we are untrained. Definitionally, our body does not reflect what a trained advanced physique is going to look like. That happens down the road. So you have to look at your frame, how much muscle your frame can support, and calculate how much mass you're going to have to gain before you're going to be very strong. For anybody that's five foot 10 or higher, you're gonna have to weigh at least 200 pounds to get the most out of your physique. The body weight freaks like Yuri Belkin and John Hack have a genetic predisposition for putting out high levels of force at a light body weight that you cannot mostly train for. You can't change your anatomical leverages, you can't change your tendon insertions, and you're very limited on what you can do with your muscle fiber profile and with your potential to top out your nervous system. So yeah, if you train that way, you will continue to get strong, 
but you're also going to pigeonhole yourself. You're going to hit a wall faster. And when you do hit a wall, you're not going to know what to do after that. The bottom line is that strength is great, but muscular size is necessary. And most of the people that look at bodybuilders and say, well, I would never want to look like that. I hate to break it to you. You're not in danger of going through a hypertrophy cycle and waking up a 300 pound mass monster. This is actually the reason I have the biggest problem here is because you have to work very, very, very hard towards mass specific goals to gain a little bit of mass. Fat loss is linear. You can always go through a six or 12 week fat loss cycle and lose five or 10 pounds like that. Gaining five pounds of muscle takes a very long time, a lot of specialized training and a lot of effort. So you don't have the luxury of being able to hit the brakes. You don't have the luxury of being like, oh, I don't wanna to get too big because that makes sure that you don't gain any muscular size at all and that you stay the same untrained waif that you were when you started. That sense of muscle mass being undesirable, I think that goes in the same category as women who think they'll grow a penis and a beard if they start weight training. And at the end of the day, your goals and what you wanna look like and emulate is entirely up to you and I'm not here to judge that. I'm speaking to the people that are hungry to perform, that are hungry to compete, who are influenced by all of the information out there that is ultimately decided by what the lowest common denominator is searching for in their YouTube search box. So that's just a little food for thought. Let me know what you guys think. What have been your experiences with modern training culture? You guys that have been around for a while, have you noticed a similar shift? Let me know in the comments. Thanks so much for watching guys. Till next time, this is Bromley, I'll see you.